This is the fourth section of the topic integer programming. The materials in this presentation corresponds to the section 9.2 in your textbook. So previously we've seen problems in which the variables needs to be integer. So we formulate those problems into integer programming. Now uh, in this section, we're going to see how we can use integer programming as well to formulate other types of problem. For example, now we're going to see how we can use integer programming to formulate the either or problem. So let's see what is meant by an either or problem. So suppose we are given two constraints of this form. We want to ensure that at least one of those constraints is satisfied. Before I go on, I need to emphasize that both constraints must be in that form. It means that first, both must be inequalities. Second, the sign must be less than or equal to. And then third, the right hand side must be zero. And then now, how can we ensure that at least one of them is satisfied? What you can do is you convert those constraints into this form. So the function f and g stays the same on the left hand side. But then on the right hand side, you change it from 0 to m times y for the first constraint, and then m times 1 minus y for the second constraint. And then here, y is a 0, 1 variable. Now you may ask, how can that conversion ensure that at least one of the original constraints is satisfied? So again, remember that y equals to either 0 or 1. So I will explain how it works by showing you that what happens when y equals 0 and what happens when y equals 1. OK, so we'll see um, the case where y equals 0 and another case when y equals 1. Let's start with y equals 0. So when y equals 0, you plug in uh, 0 to the y's. So the first constraint will be f less than or equal to 0. And then the second constraint will be g less than or equal to m. Simply, we can get this result by plugging in y equals 0 into the equation. So this 0 comes from m times 0. Anything times 0 becomes 0. And this big M comes from M times 1 minus 0. M times 1 is still M. And then if you look at these two constraints, you can see that the first one is exactly the same with the original constraint. It means that if we set Y equals 0, we are ensure that at least the constraint F less than or equal to 0 is satisfied. What about g? Because g is less than or equals to m, it may or may not satisfy the original constraint. The original constraint says g must be less than or equal to 0, but here we say g can be less than or equals to m. It means that g may be satisfied when it is less than or equal to 0. It may also need not to be satisfied when g, for example, uh, positive 1, positive 2, 3, and so on, it is bigger than, than 0, but less than or equals to m. So by setting y equals 0, we guarantee that the first original constraint is satisfied. Now we see the case where y equals 1. Again, if you plug in 1 into y's, and then you will see that the first constraint becomes f less than or equals to m, and then the second constraint becomes g less than or equals to 0. Here you notice that the second constraint means that when y equals 1, we ensure that the second constraint is satisfied. What about the first constraint? Again, because the original constraints say that f must be less than or equals to 0. But here we say f can be anything less than or equals to big M, means that f can or cannot be satisfied. 
So um, it doesn't matter because in the either or problem, we just need to ensure that at least one is satisfied. So when we set y equals zero, we ensure that f is satisfied. When we set y equals one, we ensure that g is satisfied. So this is how we can use the zero one variable to ensure that either of the constraint, at least one of them is satisfied. Now let's take a look at example six. Actually, this is quite similar with example three. If you look at um, the problem here, it says that the company considers manufacturing three types of cars, compact, mid-size, and large. And then to produce each car, it needs steel, it needs labor, and then it also yields a certain amount of profit. All those data are shown on the table. And up to this point, it's still very similar to example three. The main difference here is that to produce a type of car to be economically feasible, you must produce at least a thousand cars of that type. So it means that if you want to produce a type of car, you cannot say you want to just produce one unit or five units or a hundred or eight hundreds in, in this case. In this case, you need to either produce a thousand of that cars or more, or you don't produce that car at all. So either zero or a thousand and more. So the objective of this problem is to maximize profits. And then if we look at the data given in the problem, we see that the profits for each car is already given on the table. So $2,000 for each compact car, $3,000 for each mid-sized car, and then $4,000 for each large car. So it's obvious that our objective function is two times X1, in which X1 is the number of compact cars that we produce, three times X2, number of mid-sized car we produce, and four times how many large car that we produce. So these are the decision variables and the objective function. So let's look at how we can formulate the constraints. Remember that to be economically feasible, where we want to produce a certain type of car, we need to produce at least a thousand cars. So here, these three constraints says that Either you produce a thousand or more, which is represented by this part, or you don't produce the car at all. You may think that why we don't say, for example, like x1 equals zero. Instead, we use uh, the inequalities here. Well, we'll see uh, the purpose of these inequalities later. And then we also have the constraints related to the availability of steel and availability of labor. So these two constraints are quite similar to what we've done in example three. So on the left hand side, you just sum up um, the total use of steel. And then on the right hand side, you say whatever you use on the left must be less than or equals to the availability. Same thing for labor, whatever you use for labor to produce all cars must be less than or equal to the availability of the hours of labor. Now let's see how we can formulate the constraints that says either we produce the car with the amount of 100 units or more or not producing that type of car at all. So we write down that uh, constraints into two. First is x1 less than or equals zero and the second is x1 greater than or equals to a thousand. You might worry that by writing down x1 less than or equals to zero, we will produce cars um, with the amount of negative units. It will not happen because later in the sign restriction part, we'll say that all variables must be greater than or equals to zero. If that is the case, then why don't we just write x1 equals zero? Why do we need this inequality sign? Well, if you remember that if you want to do this 
either or constraint, then you must have a pair of equations of this form in this orange box here. You must have a pair of equations in this form. It means that you need to have the inequality instead of the equality sign. Now you see that um, the other constraint x1 greater than or equals to a thousand still does not follow the form that we want. So we need to change the sign from greater than or equal to to becomes uh, less than or equal to just like the form that is asked in this orange box. And keep emphasizing this because this is very important. You need to start with the correct form of equations before you can continue. So first thing first, make sure that your equations are already in the form that is asked as in the orange box here. Before you have the form, you should not continue. Okay, so now you have the first constraint less than or equals to, the second constraint also less than or equal to. At this point, you may proceed. So now once you have the correct uh, format for those constraints, basically what you need to do is just um, change the right hand side for the first equation becomes m1 times y1, the second equation becomes m1 times 1 minus y1. Okay, so again, the important thing is you need to start with this form of equations before you continue. Once you have the equations in that format, all you need to do is just change the right hand side according to this uh, box here. Now let's convince ourselves that the equations that we just wrote really works to um, say that either we produce a thousand cars or more or we do not produce that car at all. As usual, we'll see the case where y equals zero and y equals one. Remember that y is a zero one variable. So let's start with uh, what happens if y equals zero. So you just plug in y1 equals 0 in those equations, and then it becomes like this. So this equation guarantees that x1 less than or equals to 0, or the condition where we don't produce any car when it is less than 1,000, is guaranteed to be satisfied. Why is that the case? Well, let's check. What happens if x1 equals 0? According to those two equations in this box here, if x1 equals 0, then the first equation says 0 less than or equals to 0, which is correct. The second equation say 1000 minus 0 is less than or equals to big M, which is also correct. So x1 equals 0 is fulfilled by these constraints. Let's see if you think that what happened if you try to produce, let's say, 37 cars, which we know from the problem is not allowed. Let's check the equations. From the first equation, 37 less than or equals to 0. This is not correct. So since 37 violate the first constraint, it cannot be a feasible answer. So 37 must not be in a feasible solution because it violates the first constraint. What happens if y equals 1? Let's check uh, the equations. Plug in the y1 equals 1, and then the right-hand side becomes like this. Now let's see the case where x1 equals 1,000. Remember, because if we want to produce a car, at least uh, the amount must be a thousand units. And then if x1 equals 100, the first equation is correct. The second equation is also correct. So a thousand is a visible solution. Let's try again with 37, which we know is not a feasible solution. 
For the first equation, 37 less than or equals to m is correct. However, the second equation is not correct. So again, 37 cannot be a feasible solution. Either for y equals 0 or y equals 1, 37 violate one of the equations. So it cannot be a feasible solution. If you think now, what about um, if you produce more than a thousand cars, would it be feasible? Well, let's check if I produce 1,246 cars. It's okay because the first equation is satisfied and then the second equation is also satisfied. So we see that by setting these two equations like in this box, we may um, guarantee that when we produce cars, it will be either zero, not producing any car at all, or it will be at least a thousand. As I've said in the previous section, if you're using an optimization software, of course you cannot type in big M into that software. You need to specify a number to represent that big M. Now how to get the number, how big is big M? So same as the idea in example three, you take a look at the availability of the resources. And then for example, for compact cars, X1, you start counting uh, how many cars can you produce if we use all still available. And then how many cars you can produce if you use all labors available. And then it says if you use all the steel, you can produce 4,000 cars. If you use all the labor, you can get 2,000 cars. And then consider considering both resources, you can get 2,000 cars at most. So with the same idea, you should be able to verify that M2 equals 2,000 and then M3 equals 1,200. Again, I emphasize that you need to be able to do this. So this is the complete formulation for the problem. And as I've said before, don't forget to put the sign restrictions after uh, writing down the objective function, constraints, and the definition of all decision variables. Next, we're going to look at another condition, which we may formulate using the idea in integer programming. It is called the if-then condition. So we are given two constraints of this form. Again, I must emphasize that when you want to start doing this if-then problem, just like the either-or problem, you need to start with the two constraints of this form here in this orange box. Otherwise, you should not proceed when you do not have the constraints of this form yet. Okay, once you have your constraints in this form, and then what we want to do in the if-then condition is that we want to ensure that if the first one is satisfied, the f function, then the second one, the g function, must be satisfied too. However, if the first one is not satisfied, then the second one may or may not be satisfied. So notice that this is different from the either or. In the either or constraint, we want to ensure at least one of the constraints is satisfied. Here, it is specifically said that if the first is satisfied, then the second must be satisfied as well. Again, I will explain why it works by looking at what happens when y equals 0 and what happens when y equals 1. So when y equals 0, simply plug in 0 to the y's and then the right hand side will change to become like this. And then let's look at uh, the condition when y equals 1. Again, you plug in y equals 1 and then the right hand side will change to become like this. Now, um, if we go back to the uh, if-then condition, it says that if the first constraint, the f, if the first constraint is satisfied. If the first constraint is satisfied, it means that this function f 
as a value of greater than zero. Now you compare this two f function here. On the left, it says f is less than or equals to big M. On the right, it says f is less than or equals to zero. So it is obvious if you want to say f is satisfied, f is greater than zero, then it should go to this portion when y equals zero. See that when y equals one, you have f less than or equals to zero. So it cannot happen. So f is satisfied, then y will take the value of zero. When y equals zero, we modify the g by multiplying the whole equation with minus one, we get g greater than or equal to zero. This is exactly the second original constraint here. So when y equals zero, it means that f is satisfied and then g must be satisfied as well. Now let's go to see what happens if y equals one. I've said that when y equals one, f is not satisfied. f is not satisfied because here it says f less than or equals to zero. While in the original constraint, f must be greater than zero. Okay, so f is not satisfied. What about g? Again, I multiply the entire equation with minus one. So we get g greater than or equals to minus m. The original constraint says g is greater than or equals to zero. So here, when you say g greater than or equals to minus big M, the original constraint g may or may not be satisfied. It may be satisfied if g is greater than zero. It may not be satisfied if g, let's say, minus 100. But it's still okay because here you just say g is greater than or equals to minus big M. So that's how, um, that's how this if-then condition works. You just uh, add a variable y that may take the value of either zero or one. And then whether y equals zero or y equals one, it will guarantee that the if-then condition is satisfied. Now let's work on a concrete example. Suppose we have this condition in a zero one integer programming. If x one one equals one, then x two one equals x three one equals x four one must equal zero as well. Since this is a zero one integer programming, all variables here can only take the value of either zero or one. Since all variables must be either zero or one, we can rewrite this condition as follows. So we can convert x11 equals one to become x11 greater than zero. Why we want to convert the equality into inequality? Well, remember that when we want to formulate the if then condition, you have to start with the constraints of this form. So see for the if part, you have to have an inequality with the sign greater than. Since the value of the variable x can only be zero or one, when you say x11 one one greater than zero, it actually means exactly the same with saying x11 one one must be one. Now, what about the second part, the then part here? Again, you need to convert this equation in, uh, I mean, you need to convert this equality into an inequality. So you say that the sum of all these variables must equal zero. It will not be negative because again, this is a zero one integer programming. 
this axis can only take either 0 or 1. So it cannot take negative values. Now, you also need to notice that the sign here is still less than or equal to, while in this box you are asked to have the sign is greater than or equal to. So you need to convert the sign from less than or equals to to become greater than or equals to by multiplying the entire inequality with minus one. So up to this point, you are quite uh, okay because you already have f function here in the correct form and then you also have the g function here in the correct form so you may proceed from the previous slide we've got the correct form of f we've also got the correct form of g so then we simply apply the if then constraints by uh, doing this minus g less than equals to my f less than or equals to m times 1 minus 1. So this is g. And then what you need to do is to take negative of that to becomes like this. Less than or equals to m times y. And then for the f, you don't have to do anything. So this is f. And then you just put it here, f, and then change the right hand side. Don't forget to restrict your y to become 0 or 1 only. And that completes uh, the formulation of the if-then condition. So the main takeaways of this section formulating either or and if-then conditions is that you need to have the constraints in the required forms. So for either or, this is the required forms. For if then, this is the required forms. So you should not start doing anything before you have the constraints in this format. And then the idea of how can we control the condition of either or or if then is that we are using the y variables which can only take the value of either 0 or 1. So those are the two takeaways of this section. And then as usual, if you have any questions, just feel free to leave them in the comment section, shoot me an email or send me a message in the IDE. Thank you.